Hello everyone, my name is Eliza Volk and I am an intuitive massage therapist, a body worker, and a healer for both the planet and the people. And I have the honor to be here this evening with Prema Sheeran. Prema Sheeran has been on the path of, of transformation and healing for over 40 years. Her background is in Vedic studies and shamanic traditions, and she's a life coach, um, and it's such a pleasure to be with you tonight, Prema Sheeran. Welcome. Thank you, Eliza. So tonight we are going to talk about the topic of fear, the emotion of fear, which is so prevalent during these current times and even pre-pandemic, fear and the stress and anxiety that humans feel in their nervous system has become this conditioned way of being in the modern world. And it's so important for us to learn how to build a healthy relationship with this emotion of fear so that it doesn't unnecessarily drive our behavior and have effects on our relationships and effects on our health. And Prima is a deep wisdom keeper around the intelligence of the five emotions. So Prima, I think it'd be wonderful to start with just a very brief intro to these five emotions, um, just to set the framework, and then we'll go more into fear. Sure, so uh, let's just begin by saying that ultimately, there's a way in which the world is emotion, it is feeling. You know, if you look at all of the great wisdom traditions, they all talk about the nature of existence is love, is bliss, is joy. Quantum physics says that the nature of the universe is energy and that, uh, that it's full of feeling. So mm, we're all swimming in this ocean of feeling. And so we might call those the meta emotions. And then there are five you can call them elemental emotions or situational emotions that arise and subside like waves in the ocean that respond to particular situations that we engage with. So happiness arises when we feel connected and it supports us to celebrate. Uh, sympathy arises when there's hurt or pain in, in somebody and we reach out, it moves us to reach out and support them. Grief arises when we experience loss and it supports us to let go and value the one or whatever we've lost. Anger is what happens when somebody is violating our boundaries and it moves us to set a healthy boundary for ourselves. And fear happens when there is real physical, mental, emotional or spiritual danger in the present moment and it moves us to fight or flight or freeze. And so all of these emotions have an intelligence. They're not negative or positive. We need all of them in order to be, to have a healthy response. But what happens, and, and Eliza just uh, alluded to the fact that fear is uh, a bigger, a longer story than just what's happening during the pandemic, that over the years of Western culture developing more and more, we have privileged the rational mind over the wisdom of the heart and the body. And the more we privilege our rational cognitive ego mind, the more concerned we become with loss. Because the mind, the, the cognitive mind doesn't live in the present moment it lives in the future and in the past. And so as long as we're 
focused on the mind, we're always searching. The brain is always searching for what's going to be lost. How can I be in control so that I avoid loss? And so we've really amplified this experience of fear in our culture. Our media amplifies it. All of the advertisements amplify it. You need, you need this product and that product in order to keep yourself safe and secure. Mm. The weather is coming to get us. Nature is coming to get us. Um, you know, we amplify the fear. So we want to distinguish between healthy fear that if we didn't have it, we would be dead. It's what warns us of danger and moves us to safety. That's the gift of healthy fear. And the mind-generated or amplified fear that translates into the worry or anxiety that has become endemic for modern culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the worry and the fear almost seems uh, to be quite detrimental, you know, be besides just the physical sickness of the pandemic, but also this ongoing stress and fear that humans carry when, you know, their their physical safety might not actually be threatened in the moment, but because of the influences of the media and you know, there's there's very real things in modern society that can also make us question our survival, like bills that need to get paid or else. Um, but it it seems like it's just become a chronic underlying condition. And, you know, when we're in this fight, flight or freeze response, we're in a more primitive way of, you know, like running from the tiger or fighting the tiger or acting in a way so that we will physically stay alive. Um, but also when we're in that state, our higher cognitive thinking, our ability to connect to oneness and to see the big picture and to feel connected in community, that actually diminishes when we are in that very primal fight, flight or freeze mode. And it seems that as we're you know, wanting to create a better, more holistic, more healthy society moving forward, that it's actually going to be necessary to learn to build a better relationship with fear so that we can create the new vision so that we can come together and not see one another as threats or that everything is in fear and keeps us separate. Um, you know, in order to have a greater vision, to see the bigger picture, to connect with the divine, however we want to put it, but to create a healthier society. Yes, and uh, so one of the things is to shift our relationship with fear. What that involves, of course, is shifting our relationship with our mind. Mm. And learning how to actually entrain the mind to the heart and to be able to regulate our nervous system. And so all of this takes uh, us actually waking up and becoming aware of what it is that's going on inside us because we are creating uh, an enormous amount of stress for ourselves in the perspective that we're taking. So one of the things to, one of the important things to begin with is that uh, fear is uncomfortable, right? It is not a comfortable feeling to experience. And what we have been socialized to, conditioned to since the time we were toddlers, is that when we feel an uncomfortable feeling, we tend to ignore it and think about it instead. And so what happens with fear is that we get, we have a feeling of fear uh, and then our mind wants to look to see what, 
how can I be in control of my environment so that I don't have to experience this feeling of fear, this fear of loss? If I can just be in control, then I don't have to feel this. But then, well, unfortunately, what the mind realizes is that we're not in control. It's an endless struggle to be in control. And that produces more fear. And we get into this loop of, I feel fear, I want to be in charge, I want to be in control of my life, but I'm not in control of my life. So I'm not in control of events, anything can happen. So I feel more fear, but I don't want to feel the fear. And the mind gets completely activated into a chronic state of worry and anxiety so that we're not even necessarily aware of what we're afraid of anymore. So we, what we have to do is to start to become awake to this anxiety loop inside us. And that begins with leaning into the experience of fear as a present feeling in our body. And, and very importantly, uh, just having some compassion and kindness for it. Because that's what this part of us really wants and needs. It, it needs to be acknowledged and accepted with kindness and compassion. And what that does is it engages our heart. It mm. engages the, that, the energies of love, of compassion, the heart-connected energies. And the heart is where we gain access to our courage. It's true, absolutely. There is a lot to contend with in modern-day life. There is a lot of struggle, particularly at the moment with the pandemic, in order to deal with the, the intensity of life, with just making ends meet and survival. And yet, as Eliza was pointing out, the, if we stay stuck in the sympathetic fight-flight nervous system, we don't have access to the wisdom and the courage that we need in order to face these things. But as soon as we connect with the heart, our brain can start to entrain to the heart and we gain access to the courage of the heart and the resources of courage, wisdom, guidance that the heart provides. Mm. And this in turn shifts our nervous system away from the fight flight nervous system into the parasympathetic or rest, relax, respond nervous system that can, it's the social nervous system for a start. And so we can drop our shoulders down, relax our belly, and actually become present to whoever we're with and relate from a different place. So, and also from that heart-connected, more relaxed place, we can take a look at what our perspective is. What was going on in our mind that had us feeling like this? Because 95% of the time, we will discover that when we're feeling fear, aka anxiety, aka worry, that it's not being generated by something that's actually happening in our presence right now. It's being generated or amplified by our mind. You know, it might be a true situation that's happening in the world, but is it happening to me right now? No, it's hap I'm, I'm generating fear in this moment by focusing intensely on that. And so then we can ask, well, is this a useful and effective perspective? Is it useful for me to be generating this anxiety? 
is it effective? And no, we probably discover that if we connect with our heart, if we connect with our courage, if we connect to that wisdom, that deeper wisdom within us, there's a much more useful and effective perspective that we could take on this situation. And so in this way, we can shift that anxiety loop and attend to the fear. We're not skipping over the fear. We're not ignoring it because fear does have an important gift for us. It keeps us safe. So we're not ignoring it, but we're shifting the unnecessary fear that is amplified by our mind. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, um, you know, building the relationship with our heart and engaging our heart, um, I've, I've noticed that, so for example, for me, sometimes if I might feel fear or anxiety about something, um, I might actually start to shame myself or say like, well, you shouldn't worry about that. Like that's just on the news or, and, and then when I think about how we could drop a layer deeper into the heart, I think of, you know, how would I treat a little four-year-old who might be scared by something, you know, the ghost in the room or hearing about something frightening out there. And like, almost treating ourselves as though we're attending to this little child. And, you know, we wouldn't reprimand a child for feeling fear. We would, we would comfort them. And I'm wondering if you could just speak, you know, that's just one idea that I have of how we could actually build the relationship with our heart as though that child and being kind to that fear, having compassion for that fear that that's a way to deepen our relationship with our heart, or if there's some other suggestions that you have, Prema, so that people can learn how to go into the heart when they're feeling fear, since that's where we get that that good information from. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, absolutely. So uh, first of all, um, the important thing to realize is that in order to do that, we have to draw our mind back from its preoccupation with the object of fear, with the financial situation or the pandemic or, the, or climate change. We have to say, yes, okay, that's the situation. But for right now, I'm, I need to draw my mind back and focus it inwards on what I'm feeling right now in my body and as a, as a physical sensation or as a present experience. And having done that, then, yes, absolutely, a beautiful way of doing it is to imagine a small child, even perhaps a small version of ourselves on our lap. And how would we be with a simply frightened little four-year-old or... A small animal is also a wonderful way of doing that. And imagine that that little animal or that little child has all of the same physical sensations of this fear or anxiety or worry or sadness. And, and how would you comfort them? Of course, you would stroke them. You would beam your love and compassion into them so that they can feel accepted and cared for. And this immediately engages the heart and, and starts to shift our organism, our nervous system in this way. Uh, some other ideas that can work really well is uh, using the breath to just breathe into the heart and then breathe out uh, and beam the energy of the heart into that uncomfortable area of the body. It might be the heart that's feeling the anxiety, and so breathing into the heart and then breathing out a sense of releasing. But just staying present 
to the physical sensations and the experience of compassion and kindness rather than letting the mind wander off in various directions, which it will no doubt want to do. Another uh, resource can be to imagine yourself in a favorite place in nature, leaning up against a beautiful old oak tree or down by the ocean or swimming in the ocean or being by a beautiful creek or a river, any place that you feel safe and soothed in nature and just imagine the the healing power of nature becoming present to this feeling of heart, of whatever it is that you're feeling. And so these are some different ways that we can actually connect with that heart energy, shift our nervous system, and from there we can then shift our perspective. But one of the things that's really important here is that we tend to want to, we say, oh, look at that, I'm thinking this thing, God, why, what an idiot, why am I thinking that? And, and then I try and change what I'm thinking, but two minutes later, I'm back to thinking the same thing and feeling the same thing. And why? Because the emotion hasn't been attended to. The underlying emotion is like wind in a windmill. It's driving the mind around and around in circles. And until we actually attend to the underlying emotion, we cannot change the perspective, even though it's partly the, what we're doing with our mind that's creating the feeling in the first place. It's uh, an unhealthy loop. Okay. Yeah, you know, I'm also thinking a bit about the preventative medicine side of things where, you know, we might feel triggered into fear and these are some tools that we can do to, to deal with it. But also, um, you know, actually spending more time in nature or exercising our body appropriately or eating well for, for our constitution, um, finding ways to connect with people even during these tricky times of isolation and separation, like all of those things, like when we feel more connected, more connected to our soul, more connected to one another, more connected to nature, the fear starts to diminish. And um, I think that actually, you know, isolation leads people to more fear. If this was back in the day when we were living in tribes, the community was essential for each individual's survival. People weren't really going off on their own, making their own way. They were living within the group because there was a certain degree of uh, security and safety that came in communal living and consistent connection with one another and nature. And this is a product of the modern times that we are, we're missing this, you know, even pre-pandemic, people have their own jobs, they're in their own cars, they make their own money, they have their houses with the closed doors. And even now it's it's super enhanced because we're being programmed to be afraid of one another. Um, so what would you like to say to that, Prema, and also the preventative side of just some self-care to, you know, so we're not so activated unnecessarily by fear because we've already been taking care of our, our physical body. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, it's a, it, the subject of fear is so amplified by the pandemic because, you know, we humans have three most primary fundamental fears. One, the fear of death. Two, the fear of being uh, ostracized from the tribe. And three, the fear of loss. And not necessarily in that order, uh, but they're our primary fears. And they're all 
threatened at the moment with the pandemic, you know, mm. the loss of our own life, the loss of the life of our loved ones, the loss of connection, mm -hmm. profound, and, you know, the loss of income and security. So we're really in it at the moment. And uh, there are some important ways that we can care for ourselves, particularly if we understand that, mm, if we understand the, the basics of what we were just talking about, that this is an enormous, uh, enormous amount about how we are relating to ourselves and how we're relating to the world around us. So, you know, we've just been talking a lot about how we're relating to ourselves, mm, turning towards ourselves with kindness and compassion, shifting our perspective to something that's more heart-connected and wise. And then how are we relating to those around us? And, and by those around us, I don't just mean human beings. I mean other than human beings as well. Uh, maintaining relationship is profoundly important at the moment because we do feel so isolated. And that can be maintaining relationships with humans. And this is something that is a much bigger picture than just during the pandemic. You know, we have become so reliant on our devices and on social media to be a kind of quasi-communication. And so I was just listening to a very interesting uh, program on NPR about the, the quality, the difference. They did a study recently during the pandemic of the difference of how people felt when they engaged in a text or social media conversation with somebody and, how, and when they engage in a phone conversation with somebody. And over and over again, they discovered that people felt so much more connected when they could just hear the person's voice in real time. So right here, right now, one very simple thing is if you're going to message somebody, in some way, think about just picking up the phone and calling them. I know that's radical. Oh, my God. That, would it be awkward? Well, it might begin by being a bit awkward, but will you feel more connected? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, this is something that's going to last beyond the pandemic because we've become so addicted to our devices and our social media. And I would just want to really encourage people to remember the voice, the, the ability to see somebody, the ability to actually have real conversations. Uh, so that's one thing to keep in mind with our human beings. But what about all of those other beings that are there and available to us? to be in relationship with during this time when we're feeling isolated, to go out into the woods or down to the river or over to the ocean and really allow ourselves to engage in a relationship with these beings because they are there relating to us. They are available for friendship and kinship and their healing presence. So the, the really important part here is relationship. Relationship with ourselves, relationship with each other is, as Eliza was pointing out, a really important part of, of mm, maintaining that social parasympathetic nervous system that needs connection and helps us to 
stay connected to our heart and not fall into the anxiety loop that we can get into with our isolated mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, as a body worker and intuitive massage therapist and healer on multiple levels, but the, the main modality that I work through is by going through someone's body and releasing tension in the muscles where there can be stored trauma and anxiety and emotion that physically gets stuck in the tissues. So to also just encourage um, physical movement and exercise and self massage, or if we have a loved one that can help, you know, massage us to just calm our nervous systems. Um, because that, right, that human connection, that building relationship, and that I, it, I feel like physical touch can be really, really healing for the nervous system. And again, mm. that's something that might be harder to find during these times. So we must get creative and a bit more radical in our self care and our resourcing. You know, how do we meet these needs? Self massage learning massage with your loved ones, um, putting on the yoga DVD and, and doing a practice, but things that are just going to help us drop out of our minds since we spend so much time in our mind and looking at the screens that we need, we need to counteract all that mental activity with radically getting into our physical body to help calm the nervous system. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, I think that's been great, Prema. Is there anything else that you wanted to add? No, I think we've covered the the most important things. Uh, the only thing that I would uh, like to offer is that if people would like a little uh, fifteen minute guided meditation to help mm, work with fear when it's up in this way and to help uh, connect with the heart and find courage in the face of fear, then they can go to my website and on the audio page there's a recording there that you can listen to free. Mm -hmm. So I just want to offer that as a little bit of a resource. And Prema, do you want to just share what your website is here? I'll I'll type it into the notes as well, but why don't you go ahead and share the website? It's premasheeran.com. Perfect. Um, and that's Sheeran, that's with two E's. So it's P-R-E-M-A-S-H-E-E-R-I-N.com. And... I as well have some resources on elizavolk.com. That's V as in Victor, O-L-K, elizavolk.com. Um, I have some resources with the Thai Vedic School of Body Work where there's some sequences to learn with your partners. It's an online course and it's a great, great way to just bring physical touch into the body. That's with one of my teachers, Sebastian. And as well as some cleansing for the body and some workouts and yoga, just different embodiment practices. Um, so you can take a look at my website, elizavolk.com, if you'd like some further resources to guide yourself there. And, you know, I want to wish everyone the best of luck during these interesting transformational times and to keep in mind that when we do this work for ourselves and we calm our own nervous system, our mind, our mental anxiety, that, you know, we always have a ripple effect. Our energy, whether we're happy, sad, anxious, will have a ripple effect on those around us and also just the unseen realm. It's going to affect our behavior and our thoughts. So when we do the work for ourselves, we're actually affecting the whole consciousness in a more positive way. So for us to also remember that it's not just about us, it's about changing the collective vibration for more health and wellness and to create 
a better planet, a more enjoyable, relational, positive planet for us to live on and, and share together for ourselves and for the generations to come. That's my prayer. <laughs> Any last mm. thoughts, Prima, before we log mm. off? <laughs> a beautiful prayer. And the one thing I would add is that uh, there's nothing for us to attain. There's nothing for us to fix. We're okay exactly as we are. And if we can just keep on following our joy, following our heart-connected love, to keep it simple and just as Eliza says, beam that out into the world that is profoundly transformative for ourselves and everybody. We don't have to fix ourselves. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And thank feel you. Free yes, feel free to reach out if there's anything further for myself or for Prema. We're happy to be of assistance during these transformational times. Thank you so much.